stopped recording. So I did not record that. Same things. Okay. So let's start with what's the role of research? Why do we do research? Um, so first of all, it should be about some problem. If you're do if you're doing the research, it should be some problem that encourages en enthusiasm for you, because you're going to spend a lot of time doing it, and interest for others. There are many things that are unknown. In the regular world of natural science, you study the unknown. There's lots of things that are unknown that no one will care about if you discover them anyhow. Right? Other things are unknown and lots of people will care. You've got to find that balance. Big enough that you can publish it and enough people will care, small enough that you can solve it. But also big enough and interesting enough to you that you want to solve it. Um, and so you've got to find that balance. The, the first part, only you can answer. The second, in terms of interest, We'll help you learn the tools to help you answer what kind of interest is there in this area, because that's part of which will be. Um, to be honest, one of the reasons my citation rates are higher than some of the other faculty is that early on in my career, I made a very conscious choice. I switched from a theoretical area of computer science, where I was among the top 20 people in the world, of which there were 30 people in the world who cared, <laughs> to working in problems where there were hundreds of people that cared at the time, and now there's thousands of people that care. Right? Moving to an area that was much bigger allowed me to have, in my view, more impact because more people are reading and citing my papers and using my work. And I also work on the business side where I turn them into products and, and so I wanted to have that impact. That was a very conscious choice. Was I doing good at the other stuff? Yeah, I was among the very best. But I also recognized that not many people cared. So I can be the biggest fish in a small pond or I can be a smaller fish in a bigger pond. And as long as you don't get eaten, big pond has lots of advantages. Um, so the role of research is often like viewed from what we have now or what we've got now isn't quite good enough and we can do better right? and that's the way a lot of empirical research happens which is we have this solution but it's not a good enough solution let's do a better one and then there are things that are not at all solved so the solution right now the problem didn't even exist right until we had say computers the algorithms for automated sorting of data didn't really matter, right? But once we had computers, better algorithms for sorting became important. And once we had so much data that it didn't fit in RAM anymore, how to sort with things that don't fit in RAM became a new problem, right? Those, so the problems continue to evolve, and for a problem that evolves, finding better solutions also continues to evolve. So there's both directions you can work on. Um, in my view, it's going to consist of work that leads to a meaningful contribution and evaluates that contribution. It is not enough for you to say, Fermat's last theorem. Here's the theorem, right? But we're not going to show you the proof, right? Like, it may or may not be true. We don't know. Years later, right? You want to have some way of evaluating your contribution. And in fact, starting from how I will evaluate it is, in my view, often the important difference between good research and random project. <laughs> because I might do something that's really cool and sometimes that's really cool. And sometimes, uh, you know what? It's already been done, or it's not better than what's been done before. So if I invent a new way of doing something that's only 80% as efficient as the current way of doing it, will anyone care? Probably not. And so you got to understand how you're going to evaluate it and what that is. It generates, in some way, a better solution to the problem, and it advances the state of the art. But importantly, and we'll talk about this more throughout the semester, it doesn't have to advance the state of the art measuring the way the prior papers did. So I might have an algorithm that's only 80% as efficient as the prior algorithm, but provably protects people's privacy. And all of a sudden, that might become interesting. Because yes, the database search is slower. But now if the database gets compromised, your data is not compromised, right? And for some things, that's enough of a trade-off in space that people will say, well, that's actually a good solution, right? So sometimes the research is about figuring out my evaluation criterion is different from the past. Here's why. That's important enough that people will care. And then I, I'm not competing in the same dimension right? as I have to beat them at being faster. Right? I might be more robust. I might be more you know, improved privacy. I might be cheaper. There's lots of dimensions you can play with to, to come up with a solution. So in some dimension, you're better than the state of the art. 
not necessarily at all. It's very hard to beat them at all. Finally, if it's going to be research, it needs to be shared and have an impact. And to be shared, it probably needs to be reviewed before most will consider it having been shared. You can put whatever you want on WordPress.com. You can take your research paper, your thesis, and put it up there. But I can almost guarantee that if you do, almost no one will care because that's not where papers go. You can put them on archive. Archive's a whole lot better. And there are, there are definitely some researchers who put papers on archive that have thousands of citations that have never been published anywhere but archive. Why? Because they reached the point in their career where they don't care. They put it out there. They submitted it someplace that got rejected. They've moved on. They're not going to go back and rewrite it and try and submit it someplace else because, you know, it's Jeffrey Hinton. He doesn't really care. Right? He's got enough out there. In fact, by the time it's been rejected, it probably has a, you know, 100 citations already. He, doesn't, he just moves on to the next project. So some people will be in that category. Um, but for you, you need to think about where am I going to publish, how am I going to publish it to get it out there so that it'll get shared and have an impact. Right? What's the value of your research if only you know it? Maybe a little personal satisfaction, but you really want to get it out there and get it goes. And so we're going to talk about through how to go through this process. So what is research? So Marion Webster's definition, and this is going to go back to your, the difference between business research and, and tech research. Um, Webster's definition is a careful or diligent search, a studious inquiry or examination investigation or experimentation and discovery interpretation of fact. The last part, investigations of the discovery and interpretations of fact, is what drives a lot of CS research. And we're a little bit different, so we're more on the interpretation than, than discovery, because unlike natural sciences where the world exists and you're just trying to discover properties about it from a physics point of view or whatever, right, our world is synthetic. We can make all kinds of things that may or may not be at all related to reality. But we, so we have to find a balance of interpretation of what they're going to be. Um, but it's not in a CS sense, except for survey papers, but even then most people won't, won't consider them research, right? It is not the collecting of information about a particular subject. In other fields, in most of the social sciences, collecting information about a particular subject might be considered research. In business, it is often considered research, although it's often collecting first-hand information, not just secondary. But in 18th century literature, uh, research. It's all about stuff written in the 18th century, and you know what? It's all out there, right? There's just interpretation of stuff, but there's no new facts to discover. It's just, well, unless you find some ancient manuscript that's never been found. Most of it is different. So we need to focus on research that is in general about problems that we control and can measure with experiments or can prove theoretically you know, what they do. So it's a combination of investigation of the past work and an effort that will present the, to help others in the future. Right? So this is odd combination. I have to know what has happened to be able to say I'm better than them. But I have to advance the state of the art. I have to go forward in the future to help other people. And that's part of our goal in research, is to help the next researcher advance their work. Some of my most successful work is work that everyone beats up all the time. In fact, I will tell you, if you make a data set paper, you want to release your data set paper with a really weak benchmark that everyone can beat. Because if you release a data set that's where, where the algorithm is so good that no one can beat it, then no one's going to publish on your data set because they can't beat it. Right? They can't have a paper that says, I use their data set, I've got an algorithm, and I get 80% of their results. That's not going to be good. Right? They have to be able to beat it. So you got to find this. It's sort of odd to, to say, I'm going to hold back a little bit, and then next year I'll publish them with better results. Um, that would be the case Focuses on the algorithm rather than the result of such a majority. Because earlier you had said, assuming that your work was 80% as good as someone else's work, you need to create all the. Yeah, in a different dimension, yeah. Right. But generally, when you define a data set, so data set papers, and, and they exist in every field, right? They basically say, here's a set of data, here's the measurements you take on it. And here's how we're going to measure progress in this field, right, for this, right? So you do memory system, right? So I can imagine saying, here's a set of programs I run, right, in this new distributed memory architecture, and here's what I'm going to measure, right? And that's the point of this. And I, and I measure this, say, from real runs, right? Okay? So you've, you've taken this time to find the data. But if I have an algorithm that I also release with the data set that says, here's how well you can do on this data set, and no one can do better than that, then they're not likely to ever use your data set and publish on it because they can't beat you. So data set papers should focus on the data set and not the data set plus the world's best algorithm. You actually want a simple algorithm in data set paper 
So because you're focused on the data set, you want them to go use it. And then if you have a if you have a really good algorithm, publish that the next year or two. In fact, I'd give them a year or two to beat to, to do well, and then you can beat them all. <laughs> um, so in my view, research uh, is a set of opposites, and this is important that you understand going in. It's both fun and frustrating at the same time. Why? Because you're trying to do something somebody hasn't done before. You're trying to do something that we don't know how to do. And for many people, that's exhilarating and fun when it happens, and frustrating when it doesn't. Right? And so you have to expect this balance. And we'll talk about this when we talk about some of the, the frustration parts also come when most of your papers are rejected. So if you're doing well in my field, 25 to 30 percent of your papers are accepted at the top tier venues. If you're doing average, 10 percent are. That can be very discouraging when you're a graduate student and you've submitted papers and they keep getting rejected. But that's what the statistics tell us. We know the acceptance rates of these conferences are 25 percent or 20 percent. But that doesn't tell you that some people are doing much better than average and some people are doing much worse than average. And so you have to understand where you're at. Um, and the frustration of continual rejection is something you just have to get tough skin. You get used to it. More nervous, you put more guesses. Hmm? More nervous, you put more guesses. Uh, yes, in general. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of that. Even like the, 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 the years that people publish their most papers from, from, from top tier researchers are also the years in which they publish their best. There's this natural tendency to say, no, I'm going to focus on just one thing and do it really well. But historical bibliometric analysis shows that's generally not the case. And as I said from the one example that I have, right, one of my top 10 cited papers with like 400 citations is a paper I would have never published if you made me think about quality because I thought it was junk. Right? But everyone else liked it, so you got to figure out where it's going to be. Um, research is often, again, the set of opposites in terms of a bunch of small steps and then big insights. Right? You can spend months doing little step after little step, little, and then you take this large turn because of some, of some insight. Okay? Those insights, almost all large insights that I've seen in my career, come because you read somebody else's work. It's not like you've been sitting in the same room without reading other stuff and all of a sudden a new insight comes to you. It comes to you because you connect to something else. That something else might be something very different. Maybe you were watching a cooking show, but most of the time it's because you were reading some other paper and not even a paper in your exact area because you've already read all those before. Right? It's the tangential reading that often leads to large insights. So I encourage my students to read stuff other than the things that match the keywords they're looking for. And we'll talk more about that as well. Um, it's building on the work of others and contributing to your own work. Right? You're not going to get there if you don't build on other people's work. Um, trying to reinvent your own version of everything is just a fool's errand. You'll never catch up. The guys at Google have more time and money than you will ever come close to. So you can't say, I'm going to do, first, I'll, I'll just reinvent what Google did, and then I'll do better. Right? It's just not going to happen in, in a regular lifetime. Maybe you're that, that one in a million, but if you were, you'd still be better off building on what they have and then going farther faster. Um, so what isn't research? Research isn't about having fun with technology and playing with technology, right? You do research to solve a problem that has a goal, not just to have fun. That doesn't mean you can't have fun along the way. You can't be playing with technology. Some experimental computer science comes about because of playing with technology, where you make an observation that no one had made before, and that leads to interesting research. So the play might be important, but it is not the self of the research. It's the observations and thinking about it from a research point of view that this is something that might lead to something new. Um, it's not about book reports. Um, we'll do a survey paper in this class, and it is not an old-style old book report. A said this, B said that. We call those like annotated bibliographies, right? Book reports, we're not going to do any of that. It is not a programming project, though it may involve programming. It is not a commercial product development, though commercial product developments may build on top of research. Those have different objectives when you're going through them. Um, and it's not just doing what other people have done before, because if it's already been done, then it's not research, because it's already done. You have to figure out what you're going to do. Right? Each of these can be done as a part of research, but none of them is alone actual research. Um, so I'm going to answer next, what is fundamental research? Um, and there's an endless debate about fundamental research, basic research, applied research, finalized research, commercial research. There's lots of terms within the, for which research is the, the now that's being modified. Um, and different groups of people will have very different answers. So I'm giving you Terry's answers. Um, a first, and some might say a definitive answer is, uh, for, for the, what is fundamental is 
the study of something in a pure form with no application that leads to a result that has some scientific value as soon as it's been accepted by the scientific publication. It has, it, there's no particular application, right? That's why it's fundamental, because it has no application. Um, a second answer, if you talk to lots of people, is the result has some scientific value if it interests people and if it's novel or original. So it has some generosity that's going to go along with it. The third, and what I say, is a definitive answer. Um, so it's very different from what most academics would define as fundamental research, is a result that helps solve a problem and has some general scientific value cited by others. In fact, in my view, fundamental research is not fundamental research until it helps solve multiple real-world problems. Because to me, that's what it means to be fundamental, is it applies in lots of places, and it, applying means it helps solve a problem. Not like it could be used, but it's like not as efficient as the current way we solve a problem. Well, then it's not, that's not interesting, right? You really have to, uh, to, to look at, in my view, looking at applications derives the fundamental questions that we pursuing research. Now, that doesn't mean that the papers have to actually get into the application. A number of my most significant papers have been things where I started from a problem, and I abstracted it away, and then I worked on a much more generic version of it. Even though there's this motivating application, by the time I want to solve the application, I can't do that in one paper. It takes five papers to go from the general solution and then apply it in different places. And I've got the same algorithm that's been applied in applying it to cybersecurity, intrusion detection, and you know, image recognition. and That's OK. I can apply it in many different places. But I abstract away and work on the, f the fundamental problem, which is a common way of looking at things that impact multiple applications. And if you can do that, then you can have a much more successful career because you're looking at the abstract version and tying it to a real problem. And the reason you can't do just abstract problems is, as I learned early in my career, I can make up mathematical formulations of problems and write programs to solve them that cannot match reality because the world doesn't work that way. Right? I can make assumptions in my math that don't match how the world works, in which case there's no world that we know of in which we can apply it. Right? If we assume that gravity is something that we can vary with an electromagnetic field, I could write some really cool things to do that, but we know we can't. Right? The two don't interact as a force. Right? So, it doesn't matter what, what algorithms I have to optimize the, 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 the force lifting of a magnetic field. Right? It just isn't physically realizable. So you have to, to, to keep them uh, balanced. So, um, uh, this is just a, a cartoon. I'll leave it up for a second. Um, yeah. What term is finalized research? What is? A, finalized research. Oh, finalized research. So um, in, in a commercial sense, finalized research, and that's mostly what the term is used is in corporate research. So I can have early stage research that leads to ideas that, that relate to products. Finalized research is when I've, this is the final form of the product, right, or the final form of this research, after which there will be no more research in this project, right, we're done. Right? So uh, oddly enough, if you write the definitive paper that solves a problem, there may not be many people that cite it because you finalize it. It's done. Right? There's no more to do. It'll actually still get, because people say, oh, this problem is solved, so-and-so solved it, and whatever. So they'll get some. But in a corporate level, research projects that reach that level of finalized research means we should not be investing more R&D in this problem, because we have solved it. Or we have solved it at the level we need to to make our commercial product, which is often nowhere near the absolute best solution. But if, if I've got 99% of the efficiency and the market doesn't even care about 99, they were happy at 90, then there's no point in doing more research. Right? So that's fine. Um, and then from a, again, from an industrial point of view, if I'm going to file patents on my research, I often want to wait until I have the finalized research because I can't change what I patent after I've patented it. So I can file another one, but then I pay a lot more money. If, if filing a patent is, is cost between 10 and 120,000, depending on how many countries you file in, you might want to wait till you're closer. And this is this weird time, and probably the hardest question is, is it finalized, right? It's easy to tell after you've said that, but it's hard to tell when you're doing it, is it finalized, right? But there's some balance. Um, so, and this is just a, comp a joke about some social science stuff, which is, you know, the interviewing people, right, in, in some areas is real data, right? Whereas to some engineers, right, that's not real data, that's subjective data or whatever. 
business, you often write this, is like, you know, I, I talked to 30 customers. It's real data, yes, but it's 30 out of 30 million. It's a very small sample size. Maybe it's not as indicative as you want, so we have to understand how that's going to go. But, um, and then you'll figure out how significant it is if it gets published. The problem is it's really hard to tell how long, how many citations you will get until after you published it. So you have to, you have to come up with some better processes. So, so who does research? Uh, I'll go through this a little bit quicker and catch up. Um, graduate students, uh, master's students, and PhD students will be do it. We generally have lower expectations in terms of how much or the quality for master's students. That, however, doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Um, in, in, in computer vision, uh, there's a PhD student that came out of MIT. His master's thesis has over 50,000 citations. His PhD thesis, 20 years later, has like 50. Right. His master's thesis was really significant. His PhD, not so much, right? But that's okay. You, know, you sort of see where things go. Um, researchers at universities, postdoctoral students, faculty members, they can all do research. There's a lot of research done in industry, and a lot of industries say they do research. And the dis in fact, many industries use the mixed term R&D, research and development, because the boundaries become more blurred. Applied research in a company is still research, even if you never publish it. You might go through the same rigorous process of, Here's our hypothesis. I design an experiment. I go out and do the measurement, and then I tell no one. So that's the one difference: is that they tell no one because they they have their impact a different way. We have now understood our product, and we can sell it, and say we're better than the competition, and we are better than the competition, and we're not even going to patent it because we're not going to tell people how it works because then they could duplicate it. We're just going to we have some magic sauce you can't know, and. We got we got down to three point micro, three microns faster than Intel, even though like we're a smaller company at TMC, right? They never told people how they, they some of their processes. They did great industrial R and D, and they're leading the world in some manufacturing inventions. It can still be really good. Um, undergraduate students can do research. I publish. I, I don't even know how many papers I publish undergraduates, but I always have two to four undergrads working in my lab doing research, and I probably publish a paper every year, every other year with an undergrad. So it's not who you are, or how how advanced you are. Research is about finding that narrow place and being able to execute it. You don't have to have super advanced skills. So all of you can absolutely do research because you're well past undergraduates and my undergraduates don't have that much background and they still get it. Individuals and teams can do research, but teams almost always make the process easier. First of all, you get feedback from team members. So you just get the discussion and if we're trying to vet ideas and move forward ideas, this broad discussion can really help. Um, there can be multiple skill sets in the division of labor. One of you might be better at one aspect of the development and, than the other. One might be better at the math. Right? There's a whole bunch of things that will go with it. Uh, and each member can work to their own strengths. But in my view, the most important part of the, fact, the reason to do teams is teams can actually give you more work. You have four people. You can get more work done than one. And four times the amount of work is often what it takes to have a good research project. If you look at lots of papers, they have lots of authors, right? And that's more, more labor in one sense goes into it. But it's the diversity of thought as well. So it's in fact not as good to have four people that view the problem exactly the same way as it is to have three or four different points of view because that will lead to better research results as you go through this. Um, in today's world, they often talk about big science. Most computer science is actually not big science. Google does some big science, DeepMind, uh, and Microsoft, IBM. Right? There's a place where they have research groups of 40 people working on the same problem. That's, to me, big science. But three or four is still really important versus one. Doing research by yourself is not near as much fun. So if nothing else, you want to talk to somebody who cares about your problem. The other people on your research project will. People at home, maybe not. Right? You, my experience, do not go home and talk to your significant others or family members about your research. It does not last very long. <laughs> um, scope varies by, by who you are, level of work, PhD students. Um, we expect, I expect PhD students to contribute at the global, global world level. Your stuff is absolute world's best. We're giving you a PhD where you have piled it higher and deeper than anyone else. That's what PhD stands for, piled higher and deeper, um, in terms of a narrow area where you are the world's expert. You, I want my PhD students to know more about their thesis work than I do. Right? If they don't have insights I don't have, they're not ready for their PhD. Right? They're still behind me, which means they're not leaving the world. They got to get there to the point where there's something they've contributed that I didn't see coming forward. Um, now, do they always do that? No, but the good ones do. Um, so you want to make meaningful additions. 
Uh, masters and undergraduate students, they're going to contribute at what I would call the local, national, and maybe the world level, where they're leading up to stuff that other people will build on. But it might have been stuff that lots of other people could have done. They just didn't fi feel it was important enough, right? Because, again, you have a milieu of things to look at. There's lots of problems. This small one over here just wasn't big enough. But, you know, the guys at MIT could have done that, knocked it out in, in, in a month, and it takes a an undergrad here a year, but it's okay. Still, no one had done it. It's contributing to the world, and it's there. Might have been relatively straightforward and obvious, but you get there. And more importantly, for uh, undergraduates and early research, so it was a master's level, right? You're doing a project that gets you started down the path. So I'm going to come back to the other thing you said, right? But, you know, not wanting to take people's time. Coming back to the team and the sort of master's level en engagement, many projects have a mixed team where I'll have a PhD student or a, a postdoc, plus a, maybe a master's student, plus an undergrad, all working together. And the postdoc and the master's students right, are doing very different things on the team. So the master's students and the undergrads are learning from the graduate students, you know, sort of a tiered, there's a learning. But sometimes the learning gets reversed because there, there's some new tool that came out and the undergrad has dug deep into how do we get this to work, whereas me, I was like, okay, fine. Like, I haven't used that that feature of, of the GPU distributed function of PyTorch. So they, they can know more than me. So you can go both dimensions when you're learning. So the distributed value of different skill levels actually helps the learning on both dimensions, because you'll tend to have different skills. Um, research can be quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative is the use of mathematical models, statistics, formulaic numerical analysis to analyze results. Um, and the main approaches here related to discovery analysis, causal determination, predictions, and the results is generally something along the lines of quantitative results, such as this solution is n percent better in some dimension or dimensions. Right? So I measure something, and I measure I'm better in some way, in some number. Okay? Qualitative, as opposed to quantitative, uses non-numerical techniques to analyze the results. So again, they 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 do uh, discovery and analogy, but the, the there's not a real quantitative evaluation because this is a new problem, and here's how to solve it is often the way they come across because no one has ever solved it. And I'll tell you, in some fields, that, that doesn't cut it anymore. Even if you say, here's a new problem and here's how to solve it, what you really have to do is say, here's a new problem and here's three ways to solve it, and ours is the best. These other simple techniques don't work very well. Because people don't want to hear about your complicated technique if I could have solved it with a very simple technique. So you've got to show that we need this level of complexity. So they, they often in computer science, the qualitative techniques turn out to be quantitative as well because you still need to measure stuff. Um, and the, the, we're going to go through, through other types. So um, there are what are called pragmatics and mixed method techniques. These are generally very problem driven, rarely used in computer science, but qu commonly used in social science. And in computer science, where they're most commonly used is anything that involves human factors or human subjects. So the mixed methods are often looking at both quantitative and qualitative approaches. If I wanted to figure out how good is a user interface, I can measure how long it takes people to do stuff. But I can all, also ask them, what did you think of this user interface? How easy was it to use on a scale of one to five? How hard was it to do this? Right? Those last things are qualitative measures from which we can get some quantitative things, but they get this, that's why they're called mixed methods. You're, you start with qualitative data that you turn into quantitative and you get this combination. Um, there can be some things that are what, what I call uh, advocacy, advocacy or participatory research methods where, to be honest, they really start out with some sort of agenda um, and they're they're focused on improving outcomes for some group of often marginalized people. And so they start out with an objective. And the question isn't what's the best way to improve farming. It's what's the best way to improve farming in this extremely narrow problem because I want it to work on this group of people. Right? And I, I can't solve it the best way possible. So you end up with all these odd constraints. That doesn't make it not good research. It just limits the population. But that can still be a very large problem. Uh, and that's what I would call the participatory methods. You stick with what your participants can do. Advocacy is a little different, and I don't really like advocacy-based research where the goal is often focused on we have an agenda, and we will find the problem for which our agenda fits. You'll still see this in research. And if you identify that, you can basically say, in my view, you can find a data set for almost any problem you want, right? So you have to be careful. With it. So for CS, um, the most common approach for CS research is to attack a known problem, find and compare tools to solve it. Okay? This is not particularly exciting if I take a known problem and known tools. You will probably struggle to publish such a paper. Why? Because there's nothing novel here. Right? It's known tools applied to known problems. Um, master's thesis, yes. 
if no one's ever done that comparison of here are the five tools that we might use to solve this problem, let's see which is the most efficient. You have added real knowledge because now we know of these five, this is the most efficient. Especially if that wasn't obvious, that's useful. Um, formalize a new problem, then attack it, and then find and compare tools to solve it. So the nice thing about this is no one has solved this problem before. So if you formalize a new problem and you solve it, you are, by definition, at the state of the art because no one has solved it before. So the, the good thing about that is it's easy to be state of the art. What do you think is the hard part of that one? Uh, actually, defining a problem is easy. What's hard is defining a problem that someone cares about and you can solve, right? So I can formalize all kinds of problems, but some of them are too hard to solve and others are so trivial people don't care, right? So it's finding that, so the hard part is defining the problem, but it's finding the Goldilocks problem, just the right size. Not too hard, not too soft, not too hot, not too cold, but they can make one. Um, and then build a new tool and test it on your own private data. And you will definitely see such papers. And in my view, they are not research. Okay. What's wrong with building a new tool and testing it on my own private data? Companies do this all the time. And, and so as a corporate research, you'll see this. But Well, I, I may or may not have stacked the deck, right? It depends, right? But so that, that's the first part is I may have easily cheated by making the data so that, right? But there's a secondary problem if it's private data. No, well, I might still submit the paper for review. I guess we'll have to set the question and solve it. So, nobody cares. Well, so there's a little bit of like, you stack the deck again, no one cares to you solve the problem. The real problem is that at the word private data, if I publish on private data, then no one can compare against my algorithm. And so no one can advance to the state of the art. Right? So I made a claim but no one can contest my claim to see, did I cheat? But if I didn't cheat, even if I didn't cheat, they can't say that they're better when they do better, right? So that's the real problem. It's not building my tool and testing it on data. It's building a new tool and testing it in a way that no one else can, com can validate or compare. That's what limits the value of that research. Companies do it, however, all the time. And yes, many of them absolutely cheat. We cherry pick the data to get the results so that we can say, Four out of five dentists, right? <laughs> and they didn't say what that means. So. Um, so in my view, it's not good research until it's put in the context of related work in the field. So you need to, to tell the story that puts it in the context. It's better than the state of the art in some way, which I already mentioned. You have to choose what that way is, but you've got to be better. And it's described well enough for somebody to reproduce it. If they can't figure out how to do what you did, then it doesn't matter because no one can build on top of your work. Um, and in, in my view, we have to be a little careful. Releasing a GitHub repo is not quite the same as saying it's reproducible because we've had lots of papers. We got GitHub repos that we could not reproduce the results that were in their paper. We download the, the, the Git repo, we run it, and we get results that are very different in their paper. So the fact that they had code doesn't reproduce what's in the paper. Reproducible means you, in fact, release a GitHub repo where there's scripts that when you run them, they produce the numbers that are in the paper. Then, then it's very reproducible. It also has to be accessible to many. Um, and in the end, it's not really good until it's cited and used. But you do have to be careful because cited and used might take a little while. It might be a year before it gets cited, it might be five. It could even be 30, although that's very, very uncommon. Don't, don't build your career out of, I designed something that 30 years from now people will care about. Not a good career choice. Um, so, how are you going to put stuff into context and find related work? So the answer to this will depend on who you talk to. So if you go talk to the reference librarian on campus, um, they're, they're coming around. But they have a bunch of library databases for searching. When I started my PhD in 1983, um, started doing research, right? We barely had computers. The libraries were still card catalogs. You pulled out a stack of index cards that told you where on the shelf to go find a, uh, a journal or a book. It was monotonous and mind-numbingly difficult to go find lots of papers. Um, now we have the, all these automated tools, so you, you guys will hopefully never have to worry about that. Um, so libraries have some advantages. They can li limit your, your search to peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, and some databases are only peer-reviewed articles. So the good thing is you get rid of all the junk. 
right? Um, bad thing is you miss the stuff that wasn't in those peer-reviewed journals, and we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Um, you get more refined, sophisticated searching in most library databases and advanced searches. Uh, that used to be true. It's not really true for Google Scholar. There are some very advanced techniques that can do some things, but Google Scholar is ca caught up in the, in the other one. Um, but in my view, it's also confusing because there's so many different databases to choose from, and how to search for them is all different, so there's not a unified approach. Um, I, here is your tool. It's called scholar.google.com. If you have not been there, that is going to be your, effectively your first assignment because you're going to have to go find 25 papers for your first journal. Uh, and by the end of today, that'll be easy. Um, Scholar, uh, Google teed up with publishers, so they let them search behind their firewalls. This is part what makes this important. Google knows about papers that you cannot access because you don't have commercial rights to it. Now, because of campus, you'll have access to a whole lot, and Google Scholar will actually let you directly get to the papers that you have access to. But we still do not have a full access library here, so there'll be lots of things Google will tell you is a paper that you can't get. But that doesn't mean you can't get it. You'll have to go through the library and find some other ways to get it. But, um, they also modified the Google search algorithm so it, it includes some non-scholarly material, but excludes some of it. Um, and it's non-scholarly as defined by Google. So it doesn't include most web pages, but it does include certain kinds of white papers put out by companies and stuff, which are somewhere in the middle. Um, it's a mixture of uh, per paper and per venue citations, and they have some nice things that'll get there, and they'll, they'll have a way for you to get there to the library. But what Google doesn't do, and the journals don't do a good job either, but the, the library database journals have a little bit, is they don't control, con they don't create controlled uh, vocabularies. They don't say these are the search terms to use, which is part of what made early library indexes powerful because once you knew the right search terms, you could do very well problem is you have to learn the search terms. And so li reference librarians had a job because they knew the way to do it and none of us did. Um, they don't create the standardization of journal names and abbreviations. So one of the problems we run into is the same publication might appear three different ways and it's up to you to filter them out because they don't, they don't get rid of them all. Um, they don't give any details of which journal publishers they include other than what you can find. So there's no list of here's all the stuff that Google does because in fact it changes weekly or monthly. Paywalls can go up and down. They really don't give you any information on how the system decides what is scholarly. Uh, and they don't give an indication of when their update frequency is. So uh, we have some friends at Cornell who, are, uh, who help drive some of this stuff. And the answer to update frequency is, uh, it depends. <laughs> some things get updated more often than others. Uh, some things are once a year. Others are you know, every couple of weeks. They're, they're always crawling. But some things, they crawl and, and sequester the changes and then do a big bulk change because they don't want to mess stuff up in the middle. So they, they, they have some mixture of stuff that's going on. Um, so they're still giving, they're giving some little indication of what it works or, or what's included and excluded and why, but it, it's a good thing. So, um, your, so your first exercise for your homework is to go to Google Scholar and find a good paper in your research area. Um, and if we were doing this as a regular class and I would have told you to bring your laptop, we'd actually stop now and make you go do that. But we're not going to do that. Um, the, uh, I meant almost there, so. Um, so I'm going to go jump, see if I can get this to work, to here. And I think it's over to a new window. You have a search function that's as, uh, as fast as a regular Google search function. I know you can do any title, you can do author, you can do uh, any text, any Yeah. Okay, that is not what I expected to happen. Um, we have to stop PowerPoint. So small, I can't get it all to fit on. Maybe I have to get it closer. Oh, one of these should snap. I don't know which one makes it snap to full size. Ah. 
my laptop resolution is 4K. I've gotten so used to very large windows, I can't get them to work. <laughs> I'm like, scroll them over there. Scholar. So, to, to man, that's, that's really trying to Okay. Um, over here is a menu bar. So, if you want to know what kinds of functions you can do, if you go down here to advanced search, these are the fields you can do advanced searches with, and each one of these turns into something that you can then type at once you know how to do it. So, if I go down here and I, and I look for something published by. Um, authored by Bolt, and this is my own name correctly, so that I can misspell anything, including my name. It doesn't look right, is there? Maybe that's right. Um, and let's just go say it has all the world words of machine learning and at least one of the words security. Let's see what that does. I have no idea what it does. Okay, so automated big security text pruning classification. So it found some papers that had the right words on it. So, and if I look up here, you'll notice it put in machine learning security author colon bolt, right? So the like the extra words that in some of them they don't really mean anything. Google uses all the words in some way. I can force it to, to do a little bit more by doing pluses and minuses and quotes and whatever and all that's some of the stuff that, that we can discuss. But um, but it's, it's very powerful and it's fast, right? It, it's indexing millions of things. Right? Um, in fact, it'll sort of tell you it took about, I can't, I can't read it, but you know, it, it found this word. If I just did something really generic, machine learning, it found however many, 4,900,000 in one five seconds, whatever. So. It's searching tons of stuff. Uh, the words that you search for show up bolded down here, and you can sort of see where, which one which ones you showed up. Um, there's no the sorting here is is an ongoing thing. Google maintains some secrecy about exactly what they're sorted. There are two choices over here: sort by relevance, and that's what you don't know what they mean by relevance. And I can sort by date. Um, and when I so this is oddly enough when I sorted by date, it's the last year sorted by date, right? And that's because there's so many papers. If I have less papers, I can have bigger windows and we'll sort them. So if you're just trying to find the most recent stuff. I rarely sort by date. Instead, if I want dates to just go here and say since, whatever that is, 2019, 2020, right? this, you can limit the search uh, by going into the custom range and playing search dates and whatever. So there's a whole bunch of search functions here. Um, I will show you some of the things that are important. They're probably not in the right order because it's been a while since I've reviewed for this lecture. Um, but let's say I'll go back. Okay, so this is one of my papers, right, on, on security. And this is another one, uh, threats of adversary, for example. You'll notice this one says cited by 42, and this one says cited 12, right? This is how many papers have cited that paper, right? In fact, if I click on this link, it will show me. Here are the 12 papers that cited my big text security paper. And for each of them, then there's the same kind of links. Cited by, cited by, whatever. There's also this link here that says related articles. So you, when I, when I go to do my search, I chose some keywords. But maybe I didn't use the right keywords, especially when you're new to a field. You don't know what are the right keywords to use, and there might be subtle different meanings. Uh, in fact, if I go back to, go back one, um, adversarial threat, sorry, assessing the threat of adversarial examples. Adversarial examples here has a very narrow meaning in machine learning for this particular example that is not the real general use of adversarial and security. It is, but it isn't, so it's very different. Um, but if I click on related articles, oh, you'll also, before I go on, come on, where's my mouse? Um, here's, I can see all seven versions. So some papers have multiple versions. So here's a version that was published by IEEE. And here it says full view. And so through UCCS, I can get to the full view. 
here's a version that someone, not me actually, ended up putting up on ResearchGate, which is another place where you can get lots of things, but not necessarily everything. Um, here's a version that I posted on my local website. Here's a version that's somewhere at Harvard. <laughs> Versions of papers can show up in all kinds of places. So sometimes, even if you can't get it at UCCS, right, so if, like, this was, if you didn't have access to the library, you'd still be able to find this version and that version. So that, all the version button, all the version button is also really important if you're trying to see, was it published? Sometimes it'll show up and it might actually say, like, archive. None of these do, but it might say, like, it was published in archive, but it might have still been published someplace else. They list generally the first place it showed up. So if it showed up in archive and then in a journal, they'll often show you archive here, because it's also freely accessible, and then you gotta dig to find the right reference. Yes? So for when uh, we're preparing the citation, having it, how important, uh, what, what importance do you put on how good like, the version is? Like the credibility of the site, like is actively. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that's, and, and I think actually we have later lectures on that, it's, there's a good question, right? So the, the, there's two different schools of thought. One is you want to cite the earliest version to give people the proper credit. In my view, I make sure I cite the first people I think did the work, but I might still cite their later version if it has a better explanation. I want to cite the one that helps the reader, because that's my primary audience is the reader. Right? There might have been an earlier version, but you know what? If I go to their journal version, they'll tell me about the earlier version. So I, I say cite whichever one is the best paper to cite. Don't worry about the timing. But if one person published it in 2012 and the, the next person published in 2015, then it's not fair to, to ignore the 2012 person, even if their paper wasn't as good, because that really is the first work in the space. That's important. Right, the framework, like, you know, like, take you, you as the author. That I can get to several places. We're really looking at bibliography. You want to see accurately or like UCCS? Oh, oh, so bibliography should use the refereed source or the first source. That, that, that you get your choice of either saying this is the very first publication and later on it showed up. Uh, and by the way, all of these, you might notice that the names of them are not the same. Oh, actually, that's because I left. <laughs> so, well, normally the, the, the names can still be sometimes slightly different. Um, like difference in capitalization. Sometimes there'll be a couple words because as I change the versions of the paper, right, when it goes through review, they might say make these changes, right? But Google still says, you know what? This paper is 96% the same as that paper. We're going to put them together under all these versions. And then they'll sort of see them all. And even all the versions isn't all the versions because normally archive will only show up once. I have one paper on archive with like 26 versions because we've been updating it over the years and we just keep updating it with new results or whatever and keep it up to date, so you can go there. Um, so uh, the other thing that I was mentioning is this idea of related articles. You may not know the right keywords. So if you don't know the right keywords, you can just click on this and you'll get a bunch of related articles where Google's much more sophisticated eigenvalue-based analysis, which is still applied in the paper space, is looking at the sort of relationships between the words in lots of different papers We'll say these papers are all related. Um, right, so here's one where, like, a semantics aware classification approach for data leakage protection. The problem we were solving that paper is data leakage protection, but nothing in the title or even the abstract might have told you that because we were actually presenting it from a slightly different point of view. So, this is very powerful when you're first starting. And to be honest, with a few clicks, I can find, if I know one paper that's interesting, I can find all the papers that cited it. So here's a list of 42 papers that cited that paper. I now have 40 papers, right? And if I click on a couple of these, I can either click on what cited this paper, the thread of adversarial libre, right? a survey, right? So if it's a survey, it's gonna have both lots of citations, lots. You can quickly, you know, we have the, well, your next assignment next week will be like 50 papers, right? I have students freaking out, it's like 50 papers, it saves me forever to find, it's like, we can't even get 50 links of 50 papers in like two minutes, right? <laughs> and they're all relatively re relevant papers. Um, a couple of things that are worth pointing out here. Um, I can actually search within the citing articles. So if I find somebody, the papers that cited in my paper, not all of them will be relevant. So I can still then go search within those and say, now I want to refine it. Because after you've quickly figured out how to get to 200 papers, now you want to narrow your search. Right? You got to go both ways. So you both have techniques to, to broaden it, find a lot of papers. And then also to narrow it down and only, only that. Um, so a couple of other things within um, 
Google Scholar uh, is this button over here called My Library. So these are the things on my reading list from Google. I don't know how long it is. Uh, I think they truncated at a 10 pages of 10 each. It might be uh, 20 pages, I don't know. It, 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 I have a lot of stuff on my reading list. So things get on my reading list two ways. One is, I can go back over here, and there was a little star. And if I star it, it shows up in my library. Right? So I can not only pull up a bunch of papers, I can mark a bunch of those very quickly, put them in my library to come back and read them later. I can also get them added if I have a standing search, and I'll show you standing searches later. So I have a standing search that adds things to this, and Google sends me mail to tell me there are papers I need to read, right? Because I don't want to have to be bothered to have to keep going remembering to do it, and I don't, you know, I might forget something. So I just get a search, and it sends me stuff. Go, go read these. Um, and I don't keep up anymore, so it's, I've, I've been bad. Um, okay, so two other things about this in Google Scholar. So if I click on this little double quote, it will show me in, if I'm using Word and I want to use cut and paste, which I strongly, strongly dis-recommend, don't recommend, right? I can cut and paste in APA format or uh, Chicago format or Vancouver. These are different styles of references. Um, better is to use one of these tools. The best tool, which is actually in a separate video, so you guys can watch the video, is Zotero. That's the, the tool I recommend because it does both LaTeX and Word at the same time. Um, and I can even get a BibTeX, and here I have something I can cut and paste into BibTeX in, in Weber. So I, these, I do want to comment. This one's probably not bad. Um, these are not always right. right? So you want to be a little careful, um, especially if you don't do show me all the versions. You might get, for lots of papers, the archive version, even though you really want the, the journal version. But some of these, because these are automated parsings of things, will just have things that are completely wrong. We've had some that show up where you can tell that the author's name somehow got parsed badly, especially when you have non-Western um, uh, non names with multiple hyphens and stuff in it. Google just sometimes messes them up, and the people's names will be all mixed together in, in, in funky ways. Um, we've had years where, because of the way the typo showed up, the year was like 20,022. <laughs> A couple of zeros got showed up. Or, um, so you, you might have to check them, but for your first cut, this is a way easier way of getting all your references and putting them together. Um, I think the other stuff is venue related, um, so I will skip over that. We'll go back to PowerPoint now. Uh, so in, in some of the other content that's already up there, there's links about how to set it up so that your Google Scholar will go through the UCCS library and show you all the things you can get for free. If you're searching on campus, the way Google Scholar works, it should automatically work unless you've set it up to use some other campus's library. From campus, then it'll still take the preferences and, and merge them and do something else. But um, if you use the VPN, it also counts as being on campus. So for some students, that's just the easier way to do it. But there are times when you don't want to have to, be, to shove all your traffic through the VPN. Um, so yeah, if you, you have to configure your VPN to send all traffic through here, because Google Scholar would not come through here normally. Right? The, the standard campus VPN only sends stuff through campus through the VPN. It doesn't send all your traffic. So you'd have to make a custom configuration, which you'd have to do. You're all CS guys. You can figure that out. Um, so some issues on content, right? So um, to, to figure out what Google Scholar will do, first, it, the, the search has to have, can't be behind locked subscription barriers that don't provide access to Google. So if there's a robot.txt on the website, it, Google won't search it and include it here. But if it's a paywall, Google won't include it unless the, the publishers give Google free rights to index it. And this has been controversial. So certain journals every now and then say, no, we're not going to give Google free rights. Um, and then things disappear. And there, there, was a, there was a period of time when like Physics Today said no, and like the number of citations of people's, that people had went way down because it's Google also tracks your own citations. Um, it has to have indexes, uh, sorry, abstracts. Um, full test X is required, institute subscriptions, and there's some things they can do. Um, they include open URL links to library holdings. For example, the library link I showed you, like full text and UCCS. So that's how they work that with publishing, right? You can only get this if you can go through this library and you have to, to pay for it because they want it to keep your own uh, But they also do a lot of stuff with, with citation exercises. So uh, this is the homework exercise that I mentioned. Um, 
we already did most of this, but you know, I want to see you do this and then include some of this in your journal. So it's not just me showing you so you can actually do all of this. Go find a paper written by advisor and then find all papers written by me published in IEEE. This is actually an older version of the slide, no, the last five years, whatever, whatever the, the slide says, you know, something like that. Just show me you can do the search with multiple fields that go with it. So as I mentioned, um, there's some things you can do. You can go to the advanced search form and find out a bunch of stuff, figure out what they are. But Google has, in, in standard Google fashion, they have a weak implied and between all the words, just as in normal Google, right? Order matters a little, in case you didn't know that. The order in which words show up in Google does affect relevance to Google. So it won't affect whether or not it'll find the paper and just show, is it on the first page or the 10th page? May affect the order in which things come up. Um, if you want to include common words, which actually core Google does not allow you to do as, as well, but if I want to include words like the, um, letters or numbers or things that Google generally ignores, you can put the word uh, plus before that and Google will include it in your search. Uh, and because in science there can be times when those small articles really matter, uh, you want to include those. You can use quote marks to search for an exact phrase, so quotes force it to be that phrase. Uh, and quote marks, even for a single word, increase its relevance. So this is this weird thing. It's like, if there's a word, there's a word in quotes. It means exactly the same thing. It's like, no, no, quotes mean this is more important. I want to see this word. Um, minus sign to exclude a search term. And when I include with a minus sign, I can like not including author bolt. So I can do minus author colon bolt or minus source colon archive and get rid of all the archive papers. Um, you can use an or for, for either short term. You have to be a little careful. Google's use of or is not a standard Boolean search, and so I don't actually recommend it. I, I can, and maybe it's even gone away because I haven't used it in so long, I haven't checked. But there's author colon in title. You can also restrict by dates and publications and some things like that. And again, from the advanced menu will show you what you can actually make work. Um, I showed you this. You can find papers that cite a paper. You can find related papers. With Google's concept of related. And with those two, you can get hundreds of related papers in under five minutes. And then it becomes what we'll talk about next week's class, right? About how to browse and scan through hundreds of papers to decide what you want to keep and what you don't and what you can do with that. Right? Um, and you can use your library with little stars to keep track of stuff and manage them and come back to them later. Um, I often do my process of search in, in a sort of breadth first fashion, find all of the relevant stuff, mark it all up, and then go back and look at it, as opposed to a depth first, oh, look, here's interesting, and then, then run down that rabbit hole and run down this rabbit hole, right? So you can find whatever possible work for you. Um, there are some things you can do to uh, set up your preferences. Uh, you can set alerts. I will actually do want to show you about uh, setting up your alerts and use libraries to stuff. Um, I can also tell you that, that to great to my annoyance, but Google is going to keep it. We, we've been arguing with them. Um, your results in searching in Google Scholar are biased by your Google cache history. That is, Google knows what you've been searching for, and that will affect what you find in your Google Scholar search. My view is like, you know what? If I'm looking for a toaster, that doesn't really affect my science part of my life. Right? Um, so my recommendation is, if you want to make sure you get clean results, but especially if you want to show something to other people, um, use incognito right? and make it not use your personal data and not mess with your results. Because you get this sort of like, oh, it was on my first page of Google Scholar, and like no one else can find it. Well, you had some weird thing in your cache, so it shows up in your first page of Google Scholar, and no one else can find it. Um, so the other lectures for today, which I'm not going to go over because I, I didn't want to go more than that, are Zotero and LaTeX. So those are the tools that are on the videos that do work. So I'll, I'll stop with that piece. But I'm going to go back now and insert this and show you. Oh, it's not so showing them over here. Um, so if I go over here, go over here and I click on alerts, um, you can see the two alerts I have right now. First is uh, anyone who cites me, the new citations of my articles, right? that, that won't help you a lot, but uh, I get lots of them, so I have to keep track. I, I like to know who's citing my work because if I'm relevant to them, they might be relevant to me, and so it's an, an easy way for me to keep track of stuff. Uh, and then this particular adversarial research target. So basically, you take the terms you have in research, and then you say, show me up to 10 results, and then they'll email you 10 results every day if it finds 10 results. Um, so a pretty easy way of, of getting some, some research push at you as you're getting to understand what's going on. Um, then there's your library, your profile. 
case law, we, we don't really care about case law. Um, and then settings. So in settings is where you can set up some preferences, one of which is like, show me stuff in BibTeX, which I don't know why it's not the default it was. Um, why did that do? Okay. Settings. I'll change a few things while I'm here. I see more on the page, I have a big screen. Um, so I can, I, I, because I, I do patent work, I, I do case law. You guys won't care about that. But, so you can just make it search the articles, include patents, or whatever. Um, and then there's the library links. Oh, probably have to. Oh, I see. It's just saying I don't have cookies turned on. Fine. Um, and so here I basically have two different libraries that mine will search through. Um, WorldCat is another library that allows certain access to certain kinds of things, and so you can get there. And that's how you set them up. And basically, you just search the library, add it, and you're done. So, any questions on any of this? Okay, so we didn't have a lot of discussion today. Next week, hopefully, you will all watch the rest of the video, and then we can have discussions on the stuff you watched this week and, and, and other general things. So you came in late. You want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about why you're in this class? Yeah. Mm -hmm.